About 30 miles from Boston, Massachusetts, is the town of Sudbury. And this pretty house is one of New England's most popular places. Its name alone draws literature buffs from all over. Longfellow's Wayside Inn. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow came out here in, uh, in the mid-1800s, and uh, he sat over in the parlor, and was inspired to write uh, the tales of a wayside inn. The most famous being, listen, my children, you shall hear the midnight ride of Paul Revere. But the wayside inn has a secret. They say it's haunted by a restless ghost named Jerusha Howe. Jerusha was officially known as the Belle of Sudbury. She was celebrated for owning and playing the first piano forte in Sudbury. The Belle of Sudbury was the innkeeper's unmarried sister. According to legend, Jerusha had many local suitors, but she fell in love with a foreigner, an Englishman who went out to sea, leaving behind the promise of a hasty return and marriage. never came back. Legend has it Jerusha was broken-hearted, but that she never gave up hope that he would someday return. He never did. And today witnesses say that up this narrow staircase in room 9, the eternally unhappy Jerusha searches for her long-lost love in the face of every man who comes through the inn. I heard something that woke me up, and I sat up on the bed, looked around, there was nothing there, but uh, I felt someone sit down next to me, put an arm around me, and then gently push my head to the side until I was laying at an ang sitting at an angle. And I remember thinking, this feels very nice, so it felt very secure and very comfortable. And then I heard my wife move on the bed, and I realized that it wasn't her. But sometimes Jerusha sightings are more than just physical. There have been several reports of a woman whispering when there is absolutely no one in sight. But that's not all. I had this strong orange scent come from like my left shoulder area. And I looked at the window in front of me. It's in the same position as it is now. The window is closed. I looked at the outside window. That's closed and locked also. I'm thinking to myself, well, someone must have come by with a very orange drink. What most people don't know is, it's well documented that Jerusha Howe wore a citrus-based perfume. There are countless testimonies of a beautiful woman roaming the inn, including those where visitors may have felt awkward coming forward. So instead, they would report their sightings using an age-old New England forum known as the Secret Drawer Society, or SDS. The Secret Drawer Society is a tradition that started in the 1900s, and it is still practiced today. People secret away little notes, little scribbles of paper, in secret compartments, in drawers, under floorboards, in the ceiling, anywhere they can possibly find some kind of crack or crevice. And in those letters are people's experiences um, from, from years ago. Mark Jasper is a ghost hunter. And back in the late 1980s, he visited Sudbury to investigate the strange events happening at the Wayside Inn. His first stop, Jerusha's old room, to read the hidden accounts. There must have been uh, probably about a hundred letters. And I was very anxious to start reading them all because I wanted to see if anyone had a ghostly experience. At 4.58 a.m. I was awakened by what felt like fingernails scratching at the bottom of my right foot. The ghosts are real. We were each visited by her as we slept. I immediately woke up and found myself lying on my left side. I felt someone was against my back trembling uncontrollably. I did feel a presence in the room. A good one. She makes you feel welcome here. I have enjoyed this place. If you are a little kid, you will be scared. So you might want to sleep close to your mom Without and dad. pressure against my back, as if someone had curled up against my back and inserted their knees under my... What was that noise? Why did the lights go out? 
the sound of drums, fife, cannons. Then we thought we were in the middle of a remake of a revolutionary war. I tried to speak, but found my jaw was in a frozen state. I heard a young woman's voice whisper in my ear, I am very cold. You are very seductive. Peter. Some people have experienced a presence. One woman claimed that she had a very welcoming and very good feeling. Another letter said that every family member was visited by what they referred to as her. Others said, if you hear strange voices, it is probably the ghosts. Today, there are no pictures or portraits of the former Belle of Sudbury. Just this silhouette of her and her brother. But there are a couple of Jerusha's personal items that still exist. There is this fan and her famous pianoforte that many guests have sworn they have heard playing into the night. It's been well over a hundred years since the English gentleman went down this country road never to be seen or heard from again. But it seems his departure had an everlasting effect on the Wayside Inn. Coming up, a ghost testimony that helps convict a man of murder. Then, the bloody story that still haunts one small town. In 1673, Rebecca Cornell, a middle-aged widow, was found burned to death. Her charred body was lying by the fireplace, an apparent accident. No, it definitely wasn't unusual for a woman to accidentally be burned and sometimes burned to death. She was sitting smoking a corncob pipe, which was her tradition, and she was also sitting in front of an open fire. A preliminary investigation revealed nothing out of the ordinary, but there were a few clues that didn't add up. A lot of women traditionally wore a wool apron at that time to protect themselves from the fire because the wool, rather than burning, would smolder. And actually, Rebecca was, at the time of her death, wearing a wool apron, which seemed a bit odd, but under the circumstances, her death was still ruled to be an accident. Rebecca's body was laid to rest. But then, a few days later, in the middle of the night, her brother, John Briggs, experienced something so eerie so out of the ordinary that he felt compelled to appear before the local magistrate with his remarkable story. Uh, John Briggs claimed that he was in bed sleeping when he woke with a light like the dawn coming in uh, through his bedroom. When John opened his eyes, he saw the, uh, the form of his sister Rebecca shrouded in flames, glowing, as he said, like the light of dawn standing before him in his room. And she said to him, see how I am burned. According to Briggs, Rebecca was communicating from beyond the grave, begging for someone to uncover the truth behind her death. The bizarre story was enough to convince the judge. He ordered Rebecca exhumed, and to everyone's surprise, her body revealed an entirely different cause of death. Once it was dug from the ground and examined more closely, it was found that she had a wound just about at the level of her chest made by some kind of a sharp instrument, and that that was actually the cause of her death not burning, and a murder investigation was immediately launched. As the new story began to unfold, the clues led to one person, Thomas, her ne'er-do-well son. Witnesses came forward claiming Thomas and Rebecca had had their problems. Apparently, Rebecca, the family provider, was sick of supporting Thomas and was considering a move to Pennsylvania. The news devastated the young man. He couldn't let that happen. Perhaps he was drunk at the time. Maybe in a fit of passion, he struck her down with the spinning needle, or at least that's the prevailing theory. Then, it's quite possible that by dragging his mother's body over to the fireplace, Thomas tried to cover up his tracks. He felt that it was a reasonable thing to burn the body, suggest that he found the body in that condition, and just claim that she had been burned by accident, and really ultimately would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for the strange dream or apparition experienced by John Briggs. The ghostly testimony and this new physical evidence were enough for a formal charge of murder. The trial took place at what is today the White Horse Tavern. 
A bailiff at the trial took careful transcripts. They still exist, and they reveal just how Thomas Cornell's destiny was determined by a ghost. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Sentence death. But there's another deep, dark secret in the Cornell family tree. One that, if you believe certain traits are hereditary, might just reveal why Thomas Cornell was inclined to murder his mother. Many people have suggested that patricide may be the curse of the Cornell family. So why would patricide be considered the curse of the Cornell family? Well, 200 years after Thomas was sentenced to death for the murder of his mother, another direct descendant of the Cornell family was making headline news. Her name was Lizzie Borden. And what she was accused of was so unthinkable it turned the genteel society of New England upside down. Fall River, Massachusetts has become one of the preferred stops for murder mystery aficionados. The reason is this is where one of the most heinous crimes of the 19th century took place. And the locals say repercussions in the form of hauntings continue to echo throughout the community to this very day. Lizzie Borden was considered a spinster. At 32, she was still living at home with her father, Andrew, her stepmother, Abby, and her older sister, Emma. It was well known that Lizzie and her stepmother didn't get along, but no one could imagine what the depth of Lizzie's hatred for her father's second wife would drive her to do. On the morning of August 4th, 1892, the Borden's maid, Bridget Kelly, served breakfast as usual to Andrew and Abby. Little did they know this would be their last meal. Sometime between 9 and 9.30, the maid was allegedly outside doing chores while Abby was upstairs in the guest bedroom, taking measurements for some new bedding. Suddenly, someone snuck up behind Abby. She was attacked with what was said to have been a three-and-a-half-inch sharp-edged object to the head 18 times and once to the back of the neck. During the bloody crime, Abby's husband, Andrew, lay napping in the sitting room directly below. Then, just two hours later, he too was brutally attacked. He was hit ten times to the front of the head, left dead, uh, as he reclined on the sofa. There were three obvious suspects. The Borden's maid, Bridget, and the Borden daughters, Emma and Lizzie. But during the time in question, Emma was out of town visiting relatives, and Bridget was outside washing windows. That left Lizzie. At a three-day inquest, Lizzie offered up a number of alibis. She was reading magazines, she was ironing handkerchiefs, she was eating pears in the yard. The list went on and on. But in the course of the three days' worth of testimony, she had also placed herself in the barn looking for lead to make fishing sinkers, in the barn looking for pieces of tin to repair an old screen, and sitting up in the barn loft eating pears as well. Finally, Lizzie was arrested and tried for the murders. The trial lasted only 13 days, and Lizzie was acquitted on all counts. And if you're interested in knowing just how this woman managed to evade conviction with barely an alibi, you can investigate the crime yourself. Today, over a hundred years after the murders, most of the evidence and records of that brutal crime are still intact. In fact, here at the Fall River Historical Society, one whole room is dedicated to the Borden double homicide. The artifacts relate to her life as well as to the infamous trial. We have pages from the family Bible that list birth and death records. We have all of the known 
physical evidence to exist uh, that was actually taken into the courtroom as exhibits. The most unusual items that we would have in the collection, I would say, would be uh, hair samples. A hair piece that was knocked off Mrs. Borden's head when she was attacked. The handless hatchet, which is uh, fascinating. People come from all over the world to see it. But what really shocks many visitors is the actual graphic evidence of the brutal crimes. Some people tend to shy away from the crime scene photos because they prefer not to see post-mortem photographs. Some people come in and that's their main interest. They want to look at the photos and see if they can solve the, solve the mystery, solve the story by noticing something that someone's never seen. And there's another secret. Some items are so fragile, to put them on display would destroy them. But we got an exclusive look at two of the most fascinating. And this is from the defense's files on the case. Of the stenographer's minutes, um, witness statements that were taken immediately after the discovery of Mr. Borden's body and continuing on throughout the investigation. But at the Fall River Historical Society, there are more than just files and photographs and a potential murder weapon. There is physical evidence, too. This is a piece that has not been exhibited in years, and that's the bedspread that was on the bed where Mrs. Borden was murdered. And this bedspread reveals a forensic secret. Tiny pin spots here and there. One very interesting point is that the bedspread is actually labeled, so they could be sure to know where the blood spots were in relation to where Mrs. Borden's body was. So what does one of the most notorious crimes in the nation have to do with New England being haunted? Well, we found out that the Borden family may be long gone, but even now they are far from forgotten. up next, why the Borden murders still haunt Fall River, Massachusetts. When it comes to New England hauntings, one family's tragedy placed Fall River, Massachusetts at the top of the list. The story dates back to August 4th, 1892, when Lizzie Borden was accused of killing her father and stepmother. After a 13-day trial, Lizzie was acquitted, but the crime was never forgotten. Lizzie moved from the house she shared with her parents, but she stayed in the area for the rest of her life, and some say beyond. And here's something you should know. If you're interested in the Borden murders, you can stay overnight at the scene of the crime. We run a bed and breakfast here where people can stay over, pretty much have the run of the house, um, try to solve the mystery itself. The house can accommodate 16 guests, most of whom clamor for certain rooms. Some people want the John Morris guest room, which is where Mrs. Borden's body was found. Uh, some people prefer the Andrew and Abby suite because it does have a private bath. Some people prefer Lizzie and Emma's room. They want to try to think like Lizzie's thought, wake up in the morning, try to decide what she was thinking or decide if she really did it or not. But guests who come here may be in for another surprise. Almost every employee at the inn claims to have had at least one strange experience they simply couldn't explain. Eleanor Tibiant is the night manager. She swears she encountered a ghost in this parlor. A ghost who may have reached out from the home's dark past. The most recent experience I had was very strange and rather scary. I was walking through the sitting room, all of a sudden, as I walked past the sofa where Mr. Borden was murdered, there was this hand on my shoulder, the pressure of a hand, and at first it didn't register. I felt this tightening on my shoulder, and it just didn't register. I think it was Mr. Borden. I really do. 
Maybe he was trying to tell me Lizzie did it. I don't know. I always said, I don't think she did it. I think she had help and I, I think she was involved, but I really don't think she actually did it. So maybe he was trying to tell me she did do it. The basement seems to be the premier location for ghost sightings. Owner Martha McGinn grew up in this house, so she knew its history. But nothing prepared her for what she discovered on one particular day. I was going down the basement as I reached the bottom of the stairs coming toward me from the keep cellar room was, I can only describe it as kind of a silhouette. What Martha saw was a Victorian woman. She was maybe three inches above the floor sort of just floating towards me and then headed off towards the room where we have the washing machine now and I just dropped the laundry and ran back upstairs. The first thing that flashed through my head was either Abby or Lizzie. But that wasn't the first time Martha had witnessed something out of the ordinary while living in this house. Throughout her childhood, there were many frightening incidents. I was in the kitchen one day and I heard this banging noise and I walked out into the entry and the window was just banging up and down, up and down, up and down. But it seems that whatever is happening in the house is not reserved for the people who live and work here. Over the years, there have been several guests who claim they have sensed some otherworldly presence, a presence they believe has something to do with the grisly history of the home. No one knows why the B&B is visited by ghosts, but some believe when people make a tragic departure from life, they are caught inside two worlds trapped somewhere between the living and the dead. And that belief has led to some interesting theories as to why the house may be haunted. I think that there was a passion in the killing that had to be motivated by something very strongly felt a family member. And I think she had the most to gain and the type of personality to do it. I don't think she did it alone. I think she did it with the maid. <laughs> So who are these phantoms frequenting the inn? And why are they desperately trying to make contact? No one knows for sure. But many believe it's most likely Andrew and Abby Borden who are trying to tell the world what really happened. And as for Lizzie, well, she may still be around, even though her life had a much different but no less tragic ending. You see, Although Lizzie was never convicted of the murders, she suffered as well. After the trial, Lizzie never returned to the scene of the crime. But surprisingly, she never left Fall River either. And the next chapter of her life was as bizarre as the first. She was ostracized. She was treated as a social pariah. She had two options. If she had left Fall River, she would have been accused of running away because uh, she, they would have said that she couldn't look them in the eye because she was guilty. So she chose to stay here. It was the city that she had always called home. And she lived here for 34 years, treated by most of her contemporaries, not all, but most, as though she had done it. Guilty or innocent, we may never know. Only one thing's for certain. If Lizzie did, in fact, kill her parents, she took her secret to the grave. And here's a secret about that grave. Even in death, Lizzie had a strange attachment to Andrew and Abby. She requested to be buried right in the same cemetery, only about four feet from her alleged victims. So if you're planning a visit to New England, you might want to bring your sense of adventure. Don't forget to keep your eyes and ears open, because you might just get the ultimate vacation experience. The longing whisper of a broken heart, an encounter with an angry soul, or the touch of a couple desperately hoping to point to the answers of an unsolved crime.